I first came back to Singapore from the UK in 2007. Uh, I had done medical school there and then I worked there for a couple of years uh, postgraduate. Um, at that time, I had never even heard of infectious disease as a specialty. I didn't know it existed. Uh, and I was posted as a medical officer to the Department of Infectious Disease in SGH, uh, not of my own choosing. But I was really quite amazed uh, about the breadth that the specialty covered. Um, the spectrum of diseases that you could see was really quite amazing. Um, and you were involved in the care of patients from almost every other specialty in the hospital, for example, medical, surgical, ONG. And a lot of these patients were very complex patients. And the other teams would actually refer to the infectious disease physician when they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and this was something I found quite exciting because as an infectious disease physician, you were almost like a detective. Um, and this was, was quite exciting to me. Um, the other reason I chose to be an infectious disease physician was actually the people in the specialty itself. Um, among the people I worked with, I found there was a lot of collegiality between the, the ID physicians. Um, they were always very approachable, you could go to them for anything, they were very willing to teach. Um, and then of course there were people like Dr Tan Ban Hock, who was and, and still is a very excellent clinician and very dedicated to his patients and I think it was people like him who really made me want to become an infectious disease physician. I think ID in Singapore is still a, quite a young specialty uh, compared to the other hospital specialties. Um, I think it only started about 30 years ago um, with the likes of people like Dr. David Allen. Um, but I think since then, the specialty has really grown by leaps and bounds. Um, we started off with only a very small handful of, of ID physicians and now we have quite a large community. Um, both locally homegrown ID physicians as well as people who've come from overseas bringing their expertise and their experiences. Um, I think the specialty as well has branched out quite a lot from just individual patient care. Um, there's a lot of research going on, whether it's basic, translational, clinical research. Um, there's a lot of focus on education. We don't just educate local doctors, but people from around the region as well. Um, ID is involved in a lot of policy planning nowadays, from day-to-day -day infection control matters, uh, all the way to outbreak preparedness plans. Um, and I think. ID has also been involved in quite a lot of patient uh, advocacy, for example in HIV, which there's still quite a lot of stigma attached to that. Um, and I think there's more and more collaboration. Uh, we see more and more collaboration, not just between ID physicians from the different institutions, but also the wider medical and surgical community. Uh, for example, in SGH, we have quite good, strong partnership links with Duke and US uh, across the road. Um, what makes an ID physician an ID physician? Um, I think they are quite well-rounded individuals and I don't mean in the physical sense. Um, an ID physician needs a very good breadth of knowledge because we see such a wide range of diseases and we are involved in the care of patients from all sorts of specialties. Um, and I think uh, ID physician is always very curious about things. Um, you can always trust an ID physician to question a diagnosis or question a management plan, they don't just take things at face value uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes an ID physician an ID physician. So I was a medical student in the UK at the time of SARS so I don't really have experience living through that um, but I do see the impact it's had, it's had on uh, my senior colleagues who, who lived through it. Um, I think it was a really tough time for them you know working as well as seeing your friends and your colleagues uh, some of them succumbing to the disease, that must have been really tough. Um, and I think you get a sense among them that, you know, we always have to be prepared for the next outbreak. You always have to be on your toes, you can't be too careful. Um, I was a medical officer in SGH uh, during the H1N1 outbreak. And I think at that time there was a lot of fear and uncertainty. Nobody knew how bad things were going to get, um, whether it's going to, it was going to get as bad as SARS. But I think both H1N1 and SARS um, made people really focus, refocus their strategies on how we're going to deal with the next um, outbreak or pandemic. Um, both in terms of making sure, you know, now we have plans in place, good plans in place on how to deal with these outbreaks, um, as well as more investment into infrastructure. For example, you know, we have much better infection control facilities. And I think um, now we actually have people coming from the region to find out you know, to learn from us about how to deal with the next infectious disease outbreak. 
Personally, I think that the biggest threat we're going to face and that we're already facing is a rise in antimicrobial uh, resistance. Um, we're seeing an increased burden in, in these kind of resistant organisms from MRSA to VRE and now the very resistant uh, gram-negative organisms. Um, in the region also, we're seeing a, a rise in multi-drug resistant TB, for example. Um, and I think the big problem is that if, if, although we're seeing a rise in all these uh, organisms, the armamentarium of drugs that we have is actually quite limited. It's going to be a big burden on the healthcare system as well as on individual patients in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality. And I think we need to rethink our strategy as to how we deal with this. It has to be multifaceted. So it'll be really nice, of course, to have more investment, more research into developing new drugs, but that's not going to be enough. Um, I think we need things like antimicrobial stewardship. Um, there has to be education for both healthcare workers as well as patients, you know, on the need for judicious use of, of antimicrobials and basically good infection control measures to try and prevent the spread of these uh, resistant organisms. I think when I first started, yes, um, they were concerned because they watch you know, movies like Outbreak and, and, and that's what they think that I do every day. And now still when I tell people that I do infectious disease, sometimes I do get a look of horror and people actually step back, take one step back because they think I'm going to pass on to them. Um, but I think over time, they've kind of realised that it's not just dealing with you know, outbreaks. Um, but if, if I do have to, I mean, if it is a situation where I, I need you know, to be an outbreak situation, then um, I do have their support. Um, it's, you know, it's like wartime, you have to go in and you have to do it. And, and this is a specialty I picked. And so I think I do have their support. I think it's quite heartwarming to see um, uh, a lot of interest from the younger people, I mean I'm talking about our junior residents um, in infectious disease, I think people are becoming more aware of, of this as a specialty and you know the scope it can offer you and I think it's heartwarming that we're seeing more and more people interested and wanting to become an infectious disease physician.